The next witness is Mr. Kell. Mr. Kell. Kell, again, having excused you last time, I'm afraid we must ask you to either make an oath or take an affirmation again. Which would you prefer to do? Maybe an affirmation, Commissioner. An affirmation, if you wouldn't mind standing. Thank you so much. Repeat after me. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. I solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. Mr. Kell, do sit down. Yes, Mr. Collinson. Mr. Blazers, um, your full name is Peter Kell. Yes. Formed in a telephone. Your position is Deputy Chair of, uh, of ASIC. Yes. Uh, and <coughs> would you give the Commission your, well, I, th I think your work business address is 100 Market Street, Sydney, New South yes. Wales. Yes, yes it is. Uh, and uh, you have there, I believe, a summons to appear before the Commission dated 6 August 2018. I do. I tend to that if the... the summons Mr. to Mr. Kelly, Exhibit 5.317. Now, Mr. Kell, uh, do you also have with you a copy of your witness statement? Yes. Can I take you, please, to paragraph 37? Yes. You'll see in the last line the words due to be released soon. Yes. Referring to this relationship statement. Um, should that correctly read now published on ASIC's website? Yes. Could you handwrite that in, please, and delete the words due to be released soon and then initial your change? Yes. Uh, and one last change, uh, paragraph 195 on page 54. Uh, it's yes. really the same point. Yes. Um, in line four, do you see the words are releasing? Yes. Um, that's again referring to the same document. Uh, should it correctly read have released? Have released, yes. So if you make that change, uh, adding those words and deleting the words are releasing and initial that. Yes. With those changes, Mr. Kell, is your witness statement true and correct? Yes. I tend to that. Exhibit 5.318, the witness statement uh, of Mr. Kell. Yes, thank you, Mr. Collins, and yes, Mr. Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr. Kell, I want to just start by understanding a few particular, particular factual matters that you explain in your witness statement in relation to particular entities. If we go to page 22 of your statement, that's ASIC.0800.0013.0022, yes. you're dealing there with some steps that you took in relation to NAB and NULIS. Yes. And you make the point that in 2017, ASIC imposed additional licence conditions on Newless following ASIC's inquiries into several breach reports that had been lodged by NAB's wealth entities. That's right. And those breach reports relate to two things. One is the charging of planned service fees to members of the MKPS and MKBS where there was no linked advisor. Yes. And the second thing is some changes that were made to TPD insurance. Uh, that's uh, correct. And as a consequence of those things, ASIC was concerned and had sought from Newless and NAB either an enforceable undertaking or alternatively a change to licence conditions? That's correct. And it had originally sought that in about July of 2016? 
Around that time, yes. I don't have the exact date, but around that time. And ASIC's position was that it would be, its preference was for an enforceable undertaking? Uh, I think that was the starting position, but I don't think there was a strong preference for an enforceable undertaking or a licence condition. I would say in this instance, they are very similar in terms of what they would achieve. You understood that a licence condition was regarded as being less serious than an enforceable undertaking? Uh, no. In fact, in a range of other instances, it's generally put to us that a licence condition is, uh, can be a stronger outcome than an enforceable undertaking. To give you an example of that, uh, when uh, there was concern around the issues that had arisen with Commonwealth financial planning's enforceable undertaking and the uh, way in which there had been failures to comply with aspects of that enforceable undertaking, ASIC took the step of uh, imposing licence conditions uh, to address the failures that had arisen with the enforceable undertaking. So um, licence conditions uh, may uh, in some circumstances be, uh, be more onerous. In this instance, I would have to say that the sort of outcome that was being aimed for was relatively similar. You had a public outcome, you had a range of uh, requirements for the licensee to undertake and implement. You had a third party expert who had to oversee that and report on it uh, and so on. So uh, reasonably similar in terms of the outcome, but certainly I don't think we have a hierarchy that says license conditions above, e, uh, oh, sorry, EU's above license conditions or indeed necessarily vice versa. Your view is they will achieve a similar sort of outcome? In, in this case, yes. In, in other cases, license conditions may indeed be more onerous. Uh, my understanding that is in some, con in some cases uh, the imposition of licence conditions requires wider reporting requirements by the entity to other regulators. Um, so in those circumstances, licence conditions can actually uh, represent potentially a more onerous um, outcome. Can we bring up ASIC.0036.0002.0927? This is a letter of the 23rd of August 2016 from ASIC to Ms Smith, the Chair of Newless, and Mr Hagger, the Chair of National Wealth Management Services Limited. Yes, yes. And if we go to page three of that document. You see it the top of paragraph, or the top of the page, paragraph eight, ASIC is yep. rejecting a proposal that has been put forward by NAB and Newless for negotiated commitments. Mm. And it says, finally, ASIC does not consider that negotiated commitments are an appropriate way to resolve its regulatory concerns for the following sure. reasons. Yes. A, we again point to the number and nature of breaches and their recurrence, which suggest that a stronger and enforceable response is required. Yes. B, an enforceable undertaking is an appropriate regulatory outcome in the circumstances of our concerns. Yes. yes. And C, an EU is an administrative settlement and the mechanism we would ordinarily use to resolve serious compliance concerns, even in circumstances where a regulated entity has complied with its statutory obligations to report yes. any breaches, has cooperated and has been prepared to acknowledge ASIC's concerns. Yes. And is that subparagraph C <coughs> factually accurate? Does that reflect ASIC's position? Uh, what it reflects, I think, is that um, we typically obtain 
uh, enforceable undertakings more regularly than license conditions in these circumstances. Um, but that is not a reflection, as I said, on license conditions or enforceable undertakings indeed being one or above the other. It's uh, a simply a reflection of the reality in terms of the uh, outcomes that we often take in, in these cases. I mean, if you look at nine, uh, you have the note that uh, license conditions reflecting similar obligations are an alternative option. Yes, nine says the alternative basis upon which ASIC is prepared to resolve its concerns without enforcement action is for Newlis to consent to license conditions reflecting similar obligations as under an EU. Yes. And taking together what those paragraphs seem to suggest about ASIC's position, at least as at August 2016, is that A, an enforceable undertaking and a change to license conditions are not regarded as enforcement action? Uh, no, no, the, they are within the spectrum of enforcement action. They are not court-based enforcement action, but they are in the spectrum of enforcement action. Uh, and I think that's sort of set out in my, my statement. And B, that an EU is the mechanism that would ordinarily be used to resolve serious compliance concerns? Uh, EUs are uh, court enforceable undertakings are used more commonly when we're not looking to take a court-based uh, approach, but we do use license conditions. I've just described an instance where we've uh, done so. Um, and in, uh, in many cases, they can achieve essentially the same sort of result, the same outcome that we're aiming for. Is the starting point for ASIC when it has identified conduct that it considers to breach the law that it will commence a proceeding? Uh, that has to be considered in these matters. I, I think one of the points that um, perhaps didn't come through in the previous discussion is that we will only consider an enforceable undertaking in circumstances where if it wasn't offered or if it wasn't offered to in a way that was satisfactory to us, we would be able to and prepared to commence proceedings and with licence conditions that we would seek to impose a licence condition. Um, I mean, last financial year, as an example, uh, we, we had, I think, around 30 civil cases and around 25 enforceable undertakings. But for those in enforceable undertakings, um, a sort of a threshold test and the same issue applied when I was a commissioner at the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission, you would not seek an enforceable undertaking unless you were prepared to take the next step should it be knocked back or should negotiations fall, fall over. Otherwise, your enforceable undertaking tool would not, over longer term, have credibility. And I think that's recognised more broadly within regulators. You see, what you just said was I think one of the points that perhaps didn't come through in the previous discussion is that we will only consider an enforceable undertaking in circumstances where if it wasn't offered or if it wasn't offered to in a way that was satisfactory to us, we would be able to and prepared to commence proceedings. Yes. I don't want to suggest that in each and every case that we've worked up proceedings, but that is, that is something that uh, ASIC, and as I said in my time at the ACCC, uh, is is a, one of the basic sort of considerations that you have in place when you're uh, looking at whether an enforceable undertaking is the right approach. Um, it may offer uh, better alternatives for a range of reasons, um, but if, uh, if you don't obtain that undertaking, you have to understand that you would be prepared to take alternative action. I'm just trying to understand how this view of enforceable undertakings fits with ASIC's regulatory guide, mm. which says 
we consider that an enforceable undertaking can sometimes offer a more effective regulatory outcome than could otherwise be achieved through other available enforcement remedies, namely civil or administrative action, we will not enter into an enforceable undertaking that does not offer a more effective regulatory outcome. Is that how ASIC approaches enforceable undertakings? Uh, that is part of the decision-making process, but I'm not quite sure what, sh what you're getting at here, Mr Hodge. Do, do you see that there are two different ways that you might approach an enforceable undertaking? One way is what you say in your regulatory guide, which is if we've decided that we're in a position to commence a court action, but we think that we could obtain something more with an enforceable undertaking, then we'd be prepared to consider an enforceable undertaking. That is one way. Yes. The other way is to say an enforceable undertaking is something that we would look to as a matter of course, but we would only look to it if, if they wouldn't agree to it, we'd be willing to commence a court proceeding. Uh I'm not sure that the two are entirely inconsistent, if that's what you're getting at, but um, the, uh, you will, we will generally be looking to enter into enforceable undertakings when they do offer uh, the right sort of outcome um, and, in general, uh, a sort of outcome that provides some... Uh, potential additional or positive or alternatives to, um, to going to court. But as I said, the, part of the threshold test is if uh, ultimately uh, the entity that we're negotiating with knocks it back, um, we have to be prepared to take the next step. In the case of Newless, NAB and Newless said that they would prefer to have licence conditions. I think that's ultimately what was conveyed, yes. And negotiations then commenced over the terms of the licence conditions? Uh, yes. And in October of 2016, ASIC released its fees for no service report? Our first fees for no service report, that's right. You released updates since then? Uh, numerous updates, yes. And in the first report, the amount of fees for no service, or the quantum that was referred to in the case of MLC nominees, which is the one of the NAB trustees, was $12.6 million? That's correct, yes. And then after the report was released on the 3rd of November 2016, representatives of NAB Wealth came and gave a presentation to ASIC? Uh, yes. I understand that's correct. Oh, I wasn't at that presentation, but yes. One of the people who was at that presentation for ASIC was Andrew Mitchell. Mm -hmm. Is that right? And that was, as you understand it, the first time that ASIC was told that, in fact, the quantum of the planned service fees was about $34 million. That's right, 34, 35, around that amount, yes. But it was at that presentation that ASIC was told that for the first time? That is my understanding. And if we bring up ASIC.0061.0001.0001. This is an internal email from Mr. Mitchell to Mr. Sure. Tanzer and a couple of other, or three others. Two others, yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Mr. Tanza was then a commissioner? Mr. Tanza was at that stage a commissioner and the commissioner responsible for the superannuation at that stage. And we see Mr. Mitchell's update back to ASIC about halfway down the page. Today, ASIC was informed that the estimate for compensation for the new notices is approximately $21.7 million, which when added to the previously announced figures for the PSF breach totals $34.6 million. Yes. And at the bottom of the page, under the heading Next Steps, 
Today's update radically revises the previous compensation estimates yes. to a total of $34 million, including interest. Yes. And it said, the opinion is expressed by Mr. Mitchell, the revised figure is concerning because the company has known about the events for approximately 11 months and has only just presented the figures in a meeting today, no formal letter and just a hard copy power presentation. We are questioning whether the imposition of licence conditions is, a, is sufficient in this situation. Yes. I tend to that email, Commissioner. Email, <coughs> email Mitchell to Tanza and others, 3 November 16, ASIC 0061 0001 0001, Exhibit 5.319. Nevertheless, there was a negotiation over licence conditions with Newless, or the negotiation continued? Yes. And do you know whether there was any internal questioning of whether there should be a change in strategy in relation to NAV or Newless at this time? Uh, I was not party to any internal deliberations of that sort. But in your role now, mm -hmm. has anybody told you whether there was any internal deliberations about whether or not it was appropriate to continue with negotiating licence conditions given that information? Uh, my understanding is that the licence conditions were negotiated with Norse and then it imposed uh, soon after that, uh, very early in 2017. Um, but those license, the imposition of those licence conditions did not preclude further investigations into the conduct of Norris, uh, which uh, were uh, commenced in a formal sense at around that same time, um, that are now very well advanced and uh, that uh, deal with additional concerns that have ar arisen in respect of, of Norris. When you say are now very well advanced, mm. you're talking about are going on at the moment? Yes. And that's in relation to both the PSFs and also the advisor service fees? Uh, that is in relation to, now this is where the, uh, I'll need to make sure I've got the uh, terminology correct. But yes, in relation to the fees that were the subject of the $34, $35 million compensation. That's the PSS. Yes. Plus, uh, within Nullis, um, what we call the, the sort of no obligation or the advisor service fees where um, uh, customers left the corporate super, moved to the personal super um, plan uh, and were charged fees in a situation where there was no obligation on the part of the advisor to provide the advice and that they weren't properly informed. Um, we also have significant investigations underway uh, and well advanced in relation to NAB's fees for no service across other parts of their business in relation to personal advice fees for no service. And that personal advice in relation to fees for no service would include advice where the payment is being debited from the superannuation fund? Uh, I'd have to double check on that, but yes, that, that could well be right, yes. And the first time that ASIC raised fees for no service issues with NAB was in about mid-2015? Uh, that's about uh, right. Uh, our fees for no service project um, kicked off at around that time, um, involving, as I think you're probably aware, NAB, uh, the other three banks and uh, AMP. Um, so it's, it's a very broad-based project and we contacted all of the major entities around um, the issue of whether fees have been paid without advice services being provided across their entities, across the different licensees. Uh, we've had 27 investigations uh, as part of that project. 
I think we've collected more than two and a half million documents. You can see that we've obtained hundreds of millions of dollars so far in remediation and, and more, more, to, uh, more to come. And uh, so 31 licensees have been part of that project. So it's a very large project and NAB was certainly very much uh, a key part of that and remains so. So far, no proceedings have been commenced in relation to the fees for no service project? Uh, no, so far, that, that, sorry, that is um, uh, correct. So far, no proceedings have uh, commenced. We've had enforce, enforceable undertakings, bannings, uh, and the license condition. Um, I would expect that um, there is a very high likelihood of proceedings commencing uh, in, the, in the near future. And in terms of the remediation that has occurred so far, that is the entities agreeing to pay back money that they shouldn't have taken in the first place, plus loss of earnings on that money? Uh, broadly speaking, yes. It's, it's, it's a work in progress. It's a very, very significant um, project, the remediation project, and we have given that remediation aspect priority. You, you only have to look at the amounts involved to get a sense of as to to why. Um, so I think uh, so far there's been about 260 million paid back. But if you allow for the estimated compensation and the provisions, you're looking at 850 million. Uh, it doesn't give me any pleasure to say this, but I wouldn't at all be surprised if it ends up being uh, in excess of a billion dollars. Well, just so we can try to yeah. put this in some useful context, this is the return to customers of their money that was first wrongfully taken from them dating back to 2008 or 2009? Around that time, that's correct. And so far, the actual compensation that's been paid is about $260 million. That's right. And ultimately, you expect that at some time in the future, the total amount will, on the present estimate, be $850 million. That's right. So there's only another $790 million to go on the present estimate. I'm sorry, there's only another $590 million to go on the present estimate. You've done the maths well there, yes. Well, not the first time. And then... Assuming it gets over a billion dollars, there'll be another 150 million or so to be reimbursed to those customers? Uh, there could well be. I, I base that statement on the assumption that there will be entities that are not necessarily part of the, the big five, so to speak, who may have fees for no service issues. Uh, we've already had uh, five or so um, breach reports from other entities. Um, and it's also the fact that for those large, those the four largest banks in AMP, that they are still working through um, the amount they will have to pay back, especially in their related licensees. Typically, the work is less advanced in those uh, areas, and that's where there's um, considerable engagement on on uh, ASIC's, ASIC's part. And has there been any work to assess what profit these entities have made by having deprived customers of their money over this extended period of time? That's not something that we have sought to do at this point. Uh, it's, it's a good question. Um, I, I think I'd like to um, say that, it, well, I, I'm happy to say that ASIC will, will look at that. Uh, but I would say up until this point in time, it has been a, a very, very um, resource intensive task to focus on, if you like, the main game, getting money back into the pockets of consumers. And, and that continues. Because, and I just want to make sure we agree on this, the customers will be paid back the money plus their interest or loss of earnings. Sure. But it doesn't follow and you wouldn't assume that the earning 
that the entity is making on that money is the same or less than the earning that the customer would have received? Uh, yes, look, I, don't, I need to give that some more thought, but I, I maybe I'm drawing a link here that might be going a, a little far, but to my mind that's one of the, the points you're, you're making, Mr Hodges, is, is one of the reasons why ASIC has argued um, as part of the debate around extending our enforcement power for a disgorgement power. Um, so that we could look to tackle that more directly, the, um, the amount of money that's been made by the entities in relation to the misconduct. Another way of creating a disincentive to deter entities from engaging in this sort of conduct would be to commence civil penalty proceedings, obtain substantial civil penalties from them that would entirely deprive them of any profit they might have hoped to have made from the conduct. Do you agree? Uh, I agree, and I think you will... Um, that has been obviously one of the uh, key issues that uh, we've been considering as part of investigations in relation to a number of the entities that are within scope for the fees for no service issue and uh, I think you will expect to see that. Do you know to what extent limitation periods have already been missed because the initial contraventions occurred more than six years ago? I can't give you a comprehensive answer on that, but certainly the limitation period issue is something we um, have firmly in mind as we are, as we sort of plan and prepare for further actions. When you say you have it firmly in mind, do you mean you know that as every day there's goes a, there's by, a risk. That's right. There's a risk that for some of these matters, um, we'll we'll. Um, run into the limitation periods in a significant way if if uh, we don't um, take action soon. We're, we're certainly alert to that issue. Now, another issue that arose in relation to NAB and Neulis in 2016 was a proposed successor fund transfer where yes. NAB came to ASIC to speak about the continuance of grandfathered commissions. Yes. And the outcome was a letter. Can we bring this up? It's ASIC.0800.0011.3312. I think that's exhibit PK-151 to your statement. Mr Kell? Yes. So this is the letter that was sent to Ms Debenham of NAB and it explains that ASIC has been briefed on the proposed approach to the payment of grandfathered con commissions following the proposed successive fund transfer. Yes. And that NAB have told ASIC that based on its legal advice, it considers that Neulis should be able to continue to pay grandfathered benefits to advisors. Yes. And notes that NAB doesn't propose to seek a no action letter from ASIC. Yes. And was that the end of ASIC's consideration of this issue? Uh, in relation to uh, as in this letter, is in relation to the grandfathering aspect of that, yes. And if we go to exhibit PK150 of your statement, which is ASIC.0800.0012.1761. <coughs> and this is an internal email. I think the email addresses are cut off, but it's an email from Ms Bird to you and Mr Tanza. Correct. And it's explaining that there's this issue that has been raised by NAB. Yes. And 
then it describes what is ASIC's proposed response. And you see this about a a two thirds of the way down the page. We note that NAB's wealth, NAB Wealth's letter is unusual because yes. they are effectively letting us know what they <coughs> plan to do and testing whether we have concerns. Yes. And it said, we also note that NAB Wealth may consider our response unhelpful. <laughs> it says that, yes. And it said, in the alternative, we could consider whether we think a no action letter is needed. However, we have not done so because one, NAB have not asked us to do so. Two, the law is clearly uncertain. Three, the only relief we could grant is a no action letter, which may be of questionable value to NAB. Four, consideration of whether to grant a no action letter would take some time. The issues have industry-wide implications and raise complex legal and policy issues. That's correct. And then when we go over the page, we see that there's an explanation of what is the potentially complicated legal issue about how the platform operator provisions apply. Yes, that's one of the legal issues, yes. And so as we understand it, this issue having been squarely raised by NAB, where it was going to rely upon these provisions to continue with grandfathering of commission, ASIC didn't go on to figure out what its position was about this? Uh, not to any greater extent than the conversation, well, the the internal deliberations that led to, to this email. That's correct. And I just want to try to understand that. The grandfathering provisions have come in as part of legislation FOFA. that's recently been passed in FOFA. FOFA's now been in operation since 1 July 2013. I think compulsorily compulsorily since 1 July 2013, it was able to sort of be voluntarily complied with from 1 July 2012. Does that sound about right? Uh, yes, the grandfathering arrangements apply generally from um, 2014, is it? That was, yes. you had to have yes. an investment made by 1 July 2014. Yes, yes. And there's now a question as to how a particular exception that allows grandfathering applies. Yes. And it would seem as if there is an obvious consumer harm issue that here because ASIC believes that commissions are not good for consumers. Yes. And rather than taking any steps to investigate this issue and bring a proceeding to determine the law, ASIC didn't do anything? Uh, well, we obviously gave the issue some consideration, but given that the law uh, allows for changes, it's pretty expansive, changes to the parties to an arrangement or businesses to be on sold, uh, given that there was a high degree of uncertainty, I think the view, as you can see at that stage, was that uh, we simply, in effect, note uh, uh, NAB's view and that they've taken legal advice and that it was not seen as a matter where, uh, this was not seen as a matter where testing the law, if you like, would be productive. I mean, that's, I'm summing it up. I'm not saying those were the exact words used, but that, that's, uh, uh, I think, there are where things landed at that time. And why would it not be productive? Uh, I think there, the view from our internal legal uh, unit was that it was, uh, there was a degree of, considerable degree of uncertainty and certain, and plus a view that um, 
given what the grandfathering provisions allowed uh, by way of continuing uh, commission payments in the case of changes to arrangements and changes to ownership and so on, um, that this was not a matter where it would uh, be likely to um, warrant um, further investigation. I, I wasn't involved in the details of the discussion at that stage, I have to say. I know an email had been sent to me, um, but uh, I, th I think it's, um, you know, I'm very much prepared to say I accepted the views of uh, uh, our financial advisors team and our, our uh, legal team at that stage. You say in your statement that ASIC contacted APRA on 27 July 2016 and spoke to the APRA supervisor dealing with the comprehensive triennial review by Newlist nominees? Yes. And you've exhibited a note of the contact. It, it doesn't appear as if you raised with APRA this grandfathering of commissions. Uh, uh, I, I don't know person. that we did, but no, yeah, so if, except that I, I have no knowledge that we did. And with the benefit of hindsight, do you regard this as an acceptable outcome from ASIC's position? Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I think the question that the Royal Commission has raised here around uh, whether continuing grandfathered commissions satisfies a best, um, best interest test effectively. That's sort of part B of your questions uh, to me. Um, I think uh, with the benefit of hindsight, we should have considered that issue. Um, and we should have raised it with uh, APRA as well uh, and it's uh, an issue which I um, would say that uh, we will consider, uh, we should have considered, and we will consider it. I, I heard the evidence over the last few days from <coughs> the relevant um, witnesses from Nab and Nullis uh, about that aspect of this matter. I wouldn't want to suggest that I have formed a view on it, but I didn't find some of the reasons put forward as to why grandfathering should continue and might be in the best interest to be particularly persuasive, but I think that's something that we would need to consider. I think there's also a, a bigger issue here, and if you indulge me for a moment, Mr Hodge, I'd like to make this point. Leaving aside the legal test, Grandfathering, the entire provision, is not in the interests of consumers. Uh, the Parliament has, in effect, put in place uh, a provision that enables the continuing payment of uh, or commissions that generate conflicts of interest and unnecessary costs widely across the financial system. It was pictured as depicted as a transition uh, issue uh, of a relatively modest or limited nature. It's actually an extremely expansive provision, both in terms of the circumstances under which grandfathering is allowed to continue and the time period over which it may continue into the future. Uh, we can and should look at individual cases, but I think for the interests of consumers in the financial system as a whole, it would be highly desirable to have this dealt with at a policy level. Now, accepting that that's your view, mm. one of the things you presumably could have done in 2016, consistent with that view, is to challenge this proposition that the trustee of a superannuation fund is a platform operator and on that basis able to grandfather commissions? Uh, yes, that would be a, a um, obviously 
uh, a very technical argument. Uh, with the benefit of hindsight, I wonder whether the best interest issue would have been a more productive way into the matter. It might well be that that is a simpler way to... Yeah, and, and that was, and as I said, I, we, we didn't consider that at all. Um, uh, we should have. Now, one of the, I want to move then to another part of your statement where you talk about some investigations that ASIC has been undertaking in relation to the transition of ADAs to my super. Yes. And you deal with this commencing at page 26, which is ASIC.0800.0013.0026. Yes. And you say at page dot zero zero three zero, a paragraph one hundred and ten. On the basis of material reviewed at this stage, ASIC is of the view that there does not appear to be a systemic issue with the default transfer process, including disclosure. Uh, that is on the basis of the material that we looked at as part of the project that's described in the preceding few pages. Uh, I would have to say, given the evidence I've heard in the last few days, I, th I think more broadly there is a um, systemic issue, but the work we undertook was um, to look at uh, the transition to my super through the prism of advisor behaviour um, based on uh, a, uh, an anonymous complaint that we'd received, um, looking at it through the uh, extent to which authorised representatives, uh, as in advisors uh, and advisory firms, had um, potentially engaged in, in conduct uh, to avoid transitioning their clients across. Um, we have certainly identified a series of cases there where we are taking um, follow-up action, including potentially um, are we, um, banning action. Um, uh, but we did not find, as part of that project, that through the looking directly at the advisors, that, um, that there were large numbers of advisors who were engaging in in practices um, that were problematic in, in this context. I accept that that prism is not the broader prism around how trustees and, and wealth management firms were communicating it. Um, and so I, I would just say that's the context of that comment in 110. We then move to another topic, which is general deterrence. And you express some views about how ASIC regards general deterrence. And if we go to page 43, which is dot zero zero four three. Yes. yes. You make a point at paragraph 154 that ASIC's view is that with large money flows involved in superannuation and the financial futures of so many Australians linked to the outcome of their superannuation, it is most important that misconduct and or poor practices are broadly deterred. Does that mean deterred through enforcement action in the nature of civil litigation or do you mean something do you mean other types of deterrence? Uh, certainly, civil or other litigation is a critical part of uh, general deterrence. Uh, and in that statement, I'm expressing it broadly. Deterrence can also be achieved um, through other enforcement mechanisms, through administrative mechanisms, through licence conditions as well. Oh, sorry. Uh, but uh, um, I would very much agree that civil litigation is a key component of general deterrence. 
paragraph 201 of your statement, which is page dot zero zero five five, you say, when ASIC is provided with the right enforcement toolkit, it can use that toolkit where appropriate to achieve a deterrent effect in respect of others in the industry. And then at paragraph 203 over the page, if ASIC were to have a greater role as a conduct regulator for RSE licensees, then it would need to be provided with powers that enable it to carry out appropriate public enforcement action and have appropriate sanctions imposed. I wonder if you can help us with this. As it stands, ASIC may not have very many explicit powers or any real explicit powers under the CIS Act to bring civil penalty proceedings. But under the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act, it can bring civil penalty proceedings for false or misleading representations that are made by entities in relation to financial services. Mm -hmm. And that would presumably include where a trustee or a wealth management group makes false or misleading representations to members concerning their superannuation. Do you agree? Yes. And it has powers to commence civil penalty proceedings in respect of director's duties. That's right? Yes, yes. And do you agree that presumably the directors of a corporate trustee fundamentally need to ensure that the trustee complies with its obligations to act in the best interests of members? Uh, well, ultimately, yes. yes. And if the directors of the trustee failed to exercise due care and diligence so as to ensure the trustee acted in the best interests of members, ASIC could commence a civil penalty proceeding for that? Yes. And ASIC has the power under the ASIC Act to commence a proceeding for unconscionable conduct? Yes, obviously. And conduct of a corporate trustee or a wealth management company associated with a corporate trustee in relation to a superannuation product issued by the corporate trustee would presumably be conduct that, if unconscionable, would be caught within the ambit of the ASIC Act? I would expect so. And that would be another basis upon which ASIC could commence a proceeding for unconscionable conduct? <coughs> yes. And has ASIC commenced any proceedings against corporate trustees for either false or misleading representations or unconscionable conduct? I do not know that we've done it for unconscionable conduct. Um, uh, and I would have to check on false and misleading, but I if we have not many actions. And has it commenced any proceedings for contraventions of the director obligations? I, th I think that's part 2.7 of the Corporations Act, but I might be wrong about that. But in any event, sections 180 and onwards, has it commenced any proceedings seeking civil penalties against directors in relation to their conduct of corporate trustees in the last five years? I don't believe so in the last five years, but again, I would have In the to last check. 10 years? Yeah, I would have to check. Were there any proceedings commenced against the directors of TRIO? Uh, I think there were, yes. So that uh, may have been... Yes. All right. And so what I wonder is, When you say ASIC would need to have more powers to have a greater role as a conduct regulator, is that a statement that you see as being easily reconcilable with the fact that ASIC already has a number of powers which it doesn't exercise? I think that um, paragraph 
is a reference to the powers or provisions under the CIS Act. And there is an issue here as well around, um, uh, given you have, for want of a better phrase, the frontline legislation, um, where ASIC only has a relatively limited set of powers, um, uh, there would perhaps be, it would perhaps be desirable to clarify how and where you would expect conduct regulation to be most appropriately housed. I think we would want to under we, we are wanting to undertake further, but having said that, we are wanting to undertake further enforcement action in this area. We've re recently received additional funding to do so. It's part of our um, uh, plan to expand our uh, approach to the regulation of the super sector. Do you think on the whole, I'm sorry, I said part 2.7, I think it's actually part 2D.1 yep. in relation to the director's mm. duties. Do you think that the way in which ASIC has gone about commencing or not commencing civil penalty proceedings in relation to, say, the advisor service fees issue or the plan service fees issue gives confidence that ASIC would, if it had expanded powers under the CIS Act, exercise those powers in a way that would deter misconduct? Uh, I would point to the fact that we've already had um, some outcomes uh, against the entities, that we have significant investigations underway which are likely to lead to uh, litigation and that we've obtained hundreds of millions of dollars in compensation to date as an indication that we take these issues very seriously. I would also point to the fact that we have a more expansive track record of litigation in relation to those parts of the superannua broader superannuation sector where we are the sole regulator or the frontline regulator. So to give you an example, um, the actions that we've taken in relation to financial advisors uh, who advise on superannuation or indeed licensees in that space. Um, the National Sterling Group, the first case we took uh, to court under the new best interest provisions against NSG effectively involved a model whereby uh, the advisors in that firm were um, inappropriately rolling people over into uh, expensive or inappropriate superannuation products, selling inappropriate insurance, which was then coming out of that superannuation, uh, their superannuation. So within those areas, where we have been the sole regulator, much of our work relates directly to people's superannuation and how that is impacted through uh, poor advice or uh, misleading or deceptive conduct. You don't think though, do you, that the reason that ASIC has not commenced, there's a lot of negatives, let me put it a different way. Are you suggesting that a reason why ASIC has been reluctant to commence civil penalty proceedings in relation to the conduct of RSE licensees is because of some confusion about its role because APRA has primary responsibility under the CIS Act? No, no, it's, 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 uh, I'm simply pointing out that there are um, provisions under CIS that, that we are not responsible uh, for. Um, that would potentially provide um, the ability to take those sorts of actions. I'm not, I'm not saying it's um, because of a um, confusion around that issue. You mean if you had a power to commence a civil penalty proceeding for a failure to comply with the best interest duty, you might do so? Or the sole purpose test I had in mind. That's something that APRA presently has the power in relation to, the sole purpose test? Yes. So if you were able to do it, then you might do it. Uh, it that's a potential example. 
Commissioner, I don't have any further questions for this witness. Mr. Kell, uh, you've spoken a lot about civil penalty proceedings. Do you regard civil penalty proceedings as the best ultimate means of achieving public denunciation of misconduct? Uh, I think they can be a very effective means, but it will commission it depend on the circumstances. It might be that criminal proceedings are in some cases uh, an appropriate tool. Um, it might be that in other circumstances banning someone for life from the industry in which they're working sends a very, very powerful message um, as well. But certainly I would say that um, civil penalty proceedings are a very important part of the, uh, the deterrence toolkit. If criminal proceedings were to be launched, that would have to be uh, by the Commonwealth DPP, would it not? Uh, that's correct. And the process would entail uh, ASIC submitting a brief to Commonwealth DPP for consideration by the director of whether uh, the circumstances uh, are fit for prosecution? Uh, indeed. And... Uh, do not answer this if the answer uh, would uh, embarrass current considerations, but uh, has ASIC in the last five years uh, given consideration to submitting a brief to Commonwealth DPP in respect of any aspect of the fees for no service matter? Uh, Yes. yes. Mr Hodge? Nothing from that, Commissioner. Yes. Mr Collinson? Yes. No questions. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr Kell. You may step down. Thank you. You're excused.